excited to be here because this is my first time in Europe, my first time in Belgium, and also my first time in Ghent. In Ghent. So when I came here, Chileans, we don't know anything about Belgium, so my only reference was this movie in Bruges. <laughs> so I have a friend who lives here, and he explained me because he's a scientist, so he explained me with a scientific formula that Ghent is like Bruges, except for the annoying tourists. But since I'm uh, one annoying tourist, maybe he was a little wrong. And he also told me that you have pirates here. So when I first heard about the mystic lamp, I imagined that it was like a grill or some kind of restaurant. But then, then I found it was this really beautiful painting and that some really nasty pirates stole one part of the painting and hid it somewhere in the city for you to find it. So, this is Ruby for your two internal developers. You can see the title is different here because it was too much text to fit in only one slide. So, let's say it's Ruby for bipolar programmers and that way it sounds so much cooler. So, who am I? My name is Jano Gonzalez. It's really difficult to pronounce for foreign people. It's, imagine you are, you are saying like Hanover. It's like Hano. Okay? Let everyone repeat after me. Hano. Hano. Well, very well. So I work as CTO at a small startup. The name is Hop In. We have this incredible web clipper for iPad featured on the Evernote App Store too. So check it. But I'm here to talk about my country, specifically about pirates in Chile. So let's go back in history to a lot of centuries ago. So there is this guy, Sir Francis Drake. So there was a time where England and Spain were like not good friends like they are now. So for English people, he was a hero, a true sail, a sailor. But for the Spanish Armada and their king, he was just a nasty pirate. And they call him El Drake. That sounds more like a Mexican wrestler than a pirate. But And the king put a big reward for his head, $6.5 million in current money. And Sir Francis Drake was the second sailor to do something really awesome. It's the circumnavigation of the world. So you cross the whole world with your ship. The first one was the Portuguese uh, Elcano. But now the problem starts in Chile because Chile is a really long country. So you can see we have a lot of ports to steal, where you can steal stuff. So since Chile was just a small colony from Spain back in the days, we didn't have like an army or something to protect ourselves. So he stole every piece of gold from Valparaiso, a port we have. But he also had a hard time fighting our originary people in the south of Chile, so that's good. And he left a lot of hidden treasures. So we have this island in the south of Chile. It's called Isla Mocha, Mocha Island. And he had a lot of gold and jewelry and everything and also did a lot of pirates. But besides the nasty Indians we had at the day, there was this giant white whale, Mocha Dick, that inspired Moby Dick. So that's true, no, I'm not lying to you. So there was a big resistance for pirates in my country, so I can be proud of it. 
so now back into our current century, we have other kind of pirates in Chile. So now we have the concept of almost original DVD movies. <laughs> you can find them on the streets. And the police will be just like the Spanish Armada and will, they will try to get everything back from you. So, I already talked about pirates, so the first part is okay. Let's talk a little about Ruby, the other thing we all like. So, I will tell you a tale of two developers. So, let me introduce the characters of the beautiful story. We have the hacker and the thinker. So, the hacker is that programmer who always get things done. He or she does stuff really fast, but tends to use a lot of hacks. It's like when you bend the system, you bend components to use it just for something they weren't created originally. It's like when you use <coughs> a screwdriver just to, to put a nail on the wall. This is the, that's the hacker attitude. So sometimes that leads to maintenance nightmare because hackers tend to do code only for themselves and to prove how clever they can be. So for a typical hacker, the solution to any problem is ah, just add more duct tape and we'll be done. In the other side, we have a really opposite character, is the thinker, it's like this architect who spent all day thinking about abstractions and how to make more maintainable those systems. But sometimes he or she introduce so many abstractions that you are like very far from the original problem you were trying to solve. And sometimes they have what we call analysis paralysis. So you can be a whole day thinking how to do things the best way possible and actually don't accomplish anything. So for this thinker, always the solution is to add more abstractions. So if we send a thinker to fit Tower of Pisa in Italy, probably his or her solution will be just put another floor on top of that to make it balanced. So now we have introduced these two characters, but how does those characters relate with my own history? Because I'm here to give my testimony of faith in programming. So I'm planning to do like a self-documentary and to release a trilogy of movies. So the first chapter is the hacker years. Sounds really exciting, right? So one of the, my first accomplishments in programming is related to this beautiful game, Gorillas.Bass. Someone remember this game? Please raise your hands. Wow, a lot of, lot of people. This was a really advanced game because you needed a really powerful graphic card to run it with able to display four colors on the screen. Imagine that advanced technology, and I had access only to a monochrome graphic card, a Hercules graphics card. So I wasn't able to run this game, but as a, I was like 12 at, at, the, at the time. So what did I do? I read the whole MS-DOS uh, manual. Back in the day, we used to read stuff. It's weird, I know. And somehow I found this beautiful command, QBasic. So I started to learn basic to modify this software. And I started to copy and paste stuff and modify lines and see if anything worked. And somehow I make the, the game run on my computer. And I was so, so happy for my accomplishment. And that was a turning point in my life where I said I really love programming. 
And like six years bef uh, after, I found that I had introduced really nasty bugs on the code. Like if you threw a banana just near the other gorilla, he will die. But you know, it's how you learn. So that lead, lead me to the next step of my career, the learning years. So I'm a Latin America, so you know we have this really big macho culture. We are, we are, ten, we are trying to get past of that, but it's what we are currently. So I have this friend, but, uh, sorry, this cousin who tried to make me an adult because I was 16. I, he was like, you can do this child stuff anymore. It's time to be a real man, you know, this macho culture. So I thought, ah, he's bring me, bringing me booze maybe to, to drink. But now he arrived with this book and a couple of floppy disks with a C compiler. So I started to learn C and I was so much in love with the language. Then my mom found this C++ book and gave it to me because she said if C is good, C++ must be two times good, more good than that. So I learned how to make classes, how to program a linked list, but without actually knowing for what it was useful, but I learned that. And that led me to study software engineering in a Java school. <laughs> So I, I started to learn more stuff, and that led me to the last chapter of this beautiful documentary about my own life, the UML years. So when I started in the cubicle enterprise world, I spent most of my day drawing stuff instead of programming. So maybe a better picture for that will be this. So. When I started in the corporate world, the hacker was gone. Like, remember these two characters? It's like the hacker was replaced by this big thinker. So I started doing acronym driven development. So I used a lot of UML using the RUP process, trying to get the most of the GOF patterns and doing a lot of configuration in XML. And the worst part is was that I had Stockholm Syndrome. So I was really thinking that I, have, I had evolved as a programmer, that now I was so much better than in my hacker days when I just matched code together. And I, I was so wrong because this is the worst mistake you can do in your career, is thinking there is one true way to do stuff. Because is there really a path? And the worst is that you start to have fear, fear to deviate from this one true path. So I was really wrong. So let's have a, a same moment just to relax ourselves. So there's, there is a Zen Koan, it's this kind of history of stories to make you think and come out with an answer like one month later. So there was a student who asked uh, his master, how can I study the path? And the master replied, if you study the path, how can you walk the path? Everyday life is the path. So think about it. So now we are in this moment in my life where I was in the big corporate world, and then I met Ruby. So what's so cool about Ruby is that it's a small talk, but with pearls disguise. So you have a small talk, but with a unit's bird. So you say, ah, this is pearl small talk. And you are really confused. And the best part is your thinker is happy because you say, oh, I can do a, I don't know, for example, a proxy from the gang of four patterns just in a couple of lines. It so was, wow, doing gang of four was never so easy. But also, 
your hacker is happy because you can do really nasty stuff with one-liners. It's for the pearl inheritance. So you can really make this hacker and thinker to love each other inside your brain. And you can make them work together with Ruby. So what's really great about Ruby, have you heard about the, the concept of dichotomy, dichotomy in the Occidental philosophy? Something is black or white. There is no middle ground. But since maybe it's because Ruby is a language from Japan, you have this yin and yang kind of thinking. So the hacker can't exist without the thinker, and the thinker can't exist without the hacker. So they can live in harmony. For example, you, you can use functional programming concepts, but also do a one-liner at the same time with Ruby. And you are really able to express yourself. This, this is the example I, I have used like in 10 slide sets. But it's, Ruby feels so natural when you write it. You say, ah, oh, I want to open my text file, and for each line, I want to print the line if the line matches some pattern. So it's really natural. You really can express yourself with the language. And also, Ruby has this, this quality of hiding stuff from us. So you have to dig deeper to find the real truth. So in, in something so innocent like printing a line on the REPL, you say, oh, everything returns a value. That's inherited from the Lisp tradition. And you can say, oh, but I'm in the REPL, but actually I'm inside a class. I mean, I'm inside an object, and it's an instance of object. And also, object includes a module, and the name of the module is kernel. And actually, actually, the module kernel was the one with the method puts. So object orientation was really hidden from you. But the most hidden truth is that in Ruby, the path is no path. So this is the true way of doing Ruby. So how can you make these two personalities to work together? Well, I like to, to put my hacker disguise. I, I don't have costumes to, to be like a hacker, but imagine I'm this really cool hacker. Maybe I can do something like this. So I'm a really cool hacker now, and I'm confronted to a really new problem. And it's something like needs someone good at expeditions, like your, like your exploring team if you were a pirate. So the hacker is really good for this, because you can just code some random stuff to to test your assumptions, and you can just throw away your code later. But then you can put the thinker hat. I will try to be a thinker now, like this. So the thinker is good after you have explored the whole problem to find the acceptance criteria for a feature, think about the test cases, and to define the components that will define your solution. And you can achieve balance between delivering business value and have a lower technical depth by balancing those personality types. And you can balance, this is something really hard to achieve, the balance between creativity, really express yourself as a programmer, and have a standardized way of doing things. This is the most hard balance you, you can possibly achieve. So for example, this truck is not code intensive because we are after lunch, you know? Just a small example. So for example, 
we can code a feature and we can say, oh, can I use a case statement or a factory with the command pattern? So let's see both cases. For example, you say, ah, oh, if the account type is a premium account, I will do some stuff. It's a standard account, I will do some stuff, and so on. On the other side, you can say, hmm, but I'm putting too much stuff in just one class. So you can say, maybe I will, see, yeah, I will separate responsibilities, and will, I will introduce objects for each type of account it's like the command pattern. You have an execute method to execute the logic of this type of account. And you can say, oh, and I will introduce, oh, sorry, I, I made a mistake. This uh, account factory, I can fix it later, you know. And you can say, I will add a create method for this factory that will find, according to the type, the right type of account to instantiate. And then when I use it, I can say, ah, factory, give me an account object, and let's execute the method with some context. So we have, the we have to balance implicit versus explicit. So when you just use the case statement, you are being really explicit about the logic of your program, how it works. When you are using this factory, you are being implicit. Is something will do something here, you figure out. You have the balance between clarity in your code and don't be repeating yourself, like putting the same stuff in many parts. You, can, you need to balance the clarity of your code versus giving each component a different responsibility. And the most important, you need to balance now versus the future. So something that works now delivering value to my customers or something that I will code and will be easier to maintain in the future. So my really, really humble advice is to actually learn a lot about best practices, but don't buy, follow blindly your functional guru I made another mistake. Don't follow blindly your object-oriented guru. <laughs> and when you think about good test cases, you can later refactor your code. So you can start maybe with a hacker approach, but if you have a good test suite, you can start extracting responsibilities from each component and doing something more maintainable, and your you have like this safety net of your test. I'm not, I'm not saying to follow blindly TDD or any other uh, acronym, just to think about that. So how can we improve ourselves? If you are a hacker, you can do yourself a big favor by learning about object-oriented programming, the design of object-oriented uh, software, and learn about the gang of four patterns, architectural patterns. Also, you can learn a lot of, uh, about the functional style of programming, why it's good to have immutability sometimes, why it's good to think about streams of data instead of having this imperative approach, and learn to separate responsibilities from your, the different components of your software. On the other side, if you are a thinker, you can do yourself a big favor by learning more about one-liners, doing just a quick, a quick script for doing something in one line. Try to do some code golf, try to accomplish something with the less code possible. And don't be afraid to do the, some evil stuff, like nasty metaprogramming hacks. And for everyone, read a lot of code, and also write a lot of code. So my, my last advice, I try to put this advice in every <laughs> presentation I have ever done. It's, 
this whole being a speaker is just an excuse to put these last slides. So how do we approach learning new stuff? Just ask your martial arts trainee, trainer. The, the answer is here. As Ruby programmers, I suppose everyone reads Japanese perfectly. Well, maybe there is some guy who can read this, actually. <laughs> but it's the concept of chuhari. So when you first learn something, you have to be like a silot and follow blindly what you are learning. The chu part is when you really follow the things the way you learn, that, learn it. So if you are trying to learn about immutability, hack something with only immutable objects. Follow blindly the advice. Then you can move to the next step, which is the ha. It's when you try to break the rules you have learned. So if you have been doing a lot of gang of four patterns in your code, try sometimes to just put a simple statement instead of having so many classes. And then you will achieve the final step, which is the D. It's where you don't think about rules to follow or rules to break. You just do. It's when you truly achieve mastery or something. So in conclusion, Ruby gives you freedom. That's really important. That freedom lets you strive for balance between different approaches to solve problems. Freedom to avoid cargo cult. And freedom to distinguish between good advice and loss. There is no, nothing written in a stone in programming. And of course, there is no through path. Now, for the next slide, I won't take responsibility if you find a fat, bold, uh, bold guy dead on the street, but if you meet the Buddha in the road, kill him. What does it mean? If you think you, achieve, you have achieved illumination, you are wrong. And I, there is something I read in the last line of the GitHub coding standard that I really like is for everything else, follow your heart. Thank you. <laughs>